Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Schwaderer. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about Ruby Archaeology. I am a production engineer at Shopify. You have probably heard of them this conference. But I'll say um, there's never been a better time to work at Shopify. I'm a huge fan of the work they do. Um, seeing the work that their engineers have done over the years at Ruby Comps attracted me there and slide into my DMs or just tap me on the shoulder. Any questions you have, I'm happy to talk about that. But I'm not talking about Shopify today. Um, I'm talking about a little project that I'm interested in. And it's kind of fun when you find yourself doing a deep dive at one in the morning on a subject to start throwing it out as a CFP. And then if somebody accepts it for a talk, you can do even more hours looking into this weird subject that no one would pay you to do probably. Well, maybe. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is thank you. Thank you to the organizers, to the staff, the people who uh, put this whole thing together. The last couple of days have felt like a big chunk of healing over the last couple of years that we've been mainly at home working on our computers and not socializing. And honestly, I, I think a few people almost felt overwhelmed with it. And uh, it's one of the hardest times to make a conference, so really appreciate that. And thank you to all of you for taking 30 minutes out of your day to listen to what I have to say. So you might be asking yourself, what is Ruby archaeology? Well, it's obviously a term that I made up for this talk and it kind of covers applied uh, creeping on Ruby history via code or, or things that have happened in the past. And I'll give you a few snippets about what I've been into that kind of feed into this. So the first is I, I occasionally put out the Past Rubies newsletter. So you could go to pastrubies.live if you want to subscribe, like plug there. Um, and it just does kind of like a link list, not dissimilar to like a really tiny, not as shiny version of Ruby Weekly, but like on this week in history, but for Ruby. So it could be releases, cool talks from like all the way back to 2003, um, blog posts, uh, articles, all sorts of stuff like that. And I, and I love doing this so much. I even have my own private code I keep to myself for like doing this research that I can pass a date object into and it'll give me articles and blogs and posts from this week in history from all these different resources. And then it just has kind of like an adapter that figures out how to parse that page. So I can just run one command, and it'll give me 500 tabs uh, slowly opened up to click through and curate for the newsletter. So I automate in my own life. Um, I also wrote Portal Gun, which is a Ruby gem that allows you to take a gem file. So it'll either infer one or you can supply it. And if you have a situation where, say, a gem file.luck is corrupted, or if you're doing what I do and you look at old code and you know a time that it worked, say, March 5th, 2011, you run the portal gun executable and a date. It'll give you a full gem file pointing towards the stable versions of every gem from that date in history. But a lot of my uh, time in Ruby and, and work and reading in the past has been heavily influenced by why the lucky stiff, why was, and I think is the symbol of all that is whimsical and right with programming. I think that whimsy is core to Ruby. And I think having the care of, about the building and the art and the sharing what you do and he represented a time where you could give major conference talks without giving your real name, job, or location. And it's a bit surreal to me to think that I'm in the room or at the same conference as individuals who actually would have physically interacted with Y or interacted with Y on the internet. And it, it's just wild. And we never overlapped. I wrote my first line of Ruby in 2014. But it's still uh, quite an impact on me. Y wrote a tweet a few weeks before he disappeared in 2009. Programming is rather thankless. You see your works become replaced by superior works in a year, unable to run it all in a few more. So thinking of that, which has haunted me for a number of years, and leading into my normal interests for this talk, I say, let's run some old code. The first problem you want to do tackling this issue, at least for me, was setting up a 2009 coding environment on a 2021 machine. I lost several days to this, right? Uh, you can't just like RVM, Ruby 1.8, or RBM, or CHRU, like it, it's, not, it's not really the blessed path to do things, right? Uh, you know, uh, 1.8 and 1.9, and spoiler alert, we're going to do Ruby 1.8 today, were end of life seven years ago, and Ruby 1.8 wasn't even the latest greatest for over 14 years now. So this is not the blessed path. Um, but I think looking to our past is important. Because we now have a mature language with a feature-rich, robust ecosystem that is very supported 
globally. Like there was a time where you couldn't even get paid to do Ruby. And I think to progress forward with this language, we must keep an eye on the old code, keep an eye on the patterns, and keep an eye on the styles and debates to move forward. Uh, a motif I'll highlight in this talk is the, with the more that we work with Ruby to earn our livings, the more interest there is in kind of narrowing down on one way to use the sharp knife to write code. So let's get started. How did I actually tackle this? And spoiler alert, there are so many different ways to tackle this problem. This is not the right way. This is the way that I got away with it. Uh, first thing I did was uh, set up a vagrant box that had an operating system that was germane to 2008. So again, I'm focusing on the year 2008, kind of bleeding into 2009 for parts of this. And if you're, I don't expect any knowledge here. If you're like, what in the world is Vagrant? Uh, it just lets you set up this box on your machine and I'll just give you commands, just copy paste. Brew install Vagrant, Vagrant in it, this exact version of Ubuntu, up SSH or in the terminal, right? That's all, that's all you need to care about. So we're, we're partway there. We've got the operating system, but we're still not quite in the past. We're pointing towards modern packages. So if you're trying to app get packages, into here, you're, you're pointing towards 2021. Well, that's gonna cause you all sorts of headache and you're not fully synced yet. So something that I did to tackle this was I went to the sources.list and there's actually um, a, repo a website out there that maintains old releases. And so you just need to make sure that you tell your operating system to point to that. So swap us.archive and security for old releases. You don't have to do a cute sed argument. You can just nano or vim into it and like type it yourself. I just was so pleased that I was using sed that I wanted to put it in the slide. <laughs> and again, another thing, I'll, I'll underline this in your thinking process. You're in 2008 now, act like it. Don't think like, oh, I'm bad and feel guilt and li like all this. So, so make your search engine, whatever you use, use the flag. This is actually quite a powerful feature we never get to use. So if you want to be January 10th, 2009, say before January 11th, 2009, it'll give you like what were the latest grace. It probably uh, searches it even better, right, than it did 12 years ago. And I found that to be incredibly helpful. So, for the, so now we've, we're, we're able to get packages from 2008 and we've got our operating system and we're, we're typing code in there, so that's pretty good. And for the next steps, I got Ruby in the one way I would never get Ruby in real life. I did app get install Ruby dev and it just worked. Ruby 1.8.7 right out of the box. Pretty cool. And, and it also, like, think about it this way. I'm never gonna do a different version of Ruby for, in this container, right? Like, I, this is the version of Ruby I want to play with in this sandbox and share with you in, in code today. I was able to get Ruby gems as well because that had been around for about four years and also uh, Git. But there was a couple of problems here with these because we're talking to the outside world. So if you're trying to use Git, to like get clone from modern existing infrastructure, it's just, it's gonna complain, it's gonna fight. And then Ruby gems for gem install, similarly, you know, it's just a different protocol, you know, you'd probably have to alter the package a little bit. So I couldn't use Git or Ruby gems to talk to the outside world. So I was thinking, right, I've got a limited tool set, how can I MacGyver this to work? And I realized to just do it in a couple of steps. So an alternative method I used to snag and install gems was just literally, if you remember you go to Ruby gems and there's the download link, just download the dot gem, just use it from your terminal. And then gem install supports the local flag, which we probably use for development, right? And just do that to install your gem. And voila, you're in business and you're officially just playing with all the gems you want. Just remember, you're gonna be doing loads of dependencies and every time you get a bug, just know it's almost certainly a package that you need to install for that. So okay, we're in business. We have a machine that works. We're able to get Ruby gems. And for this part of the talk, I'd like to look at a couple of them and run them in real life to show you that I actually got them working. And then I'd also like to step out and look at the library code from the time, because I think that's part of the ethos of this talk. So the first thing is hpercot. Put your hand up if you've heard of hpercot. Holy mackerel! I did not expect that many people. I'm so pleased, because hpercot, uh, was, was uh, one of Wise Gems that wasn't actively developed after we left, so I wasn't sure. So it's not necessarily uh, the industri industry standard anymore, but it was the industry standard for HTML parsing up until and through 2008. And if I know what I'm doing here, <laughs> I'm not gonna do a live coding demo for you. I recorded it, and I've altered the speed so you don't know how slow I type in real life. <laughs> um, 
So let's look at hpercot. This is in my box. This is in the terminal. So you require hpercot. And one of the things I really liked with this API that Y designed was you just have straight up hpercot and then parens. No dot new, no setting up instantiation. You just pass your file or your HTML directly into it. And then it takes it, and then we're able to kind of manipulate it. And th in this case, I'll just do something really simple where I'm gonna take the document and iterate over table rows. And again, I like this with the forward slash and just punching in the string table TR. And we're gonna grab each of those rows in turn, and then we're gonna iterate through the cells and say if the first cell is lamb and the second cell is premium, that's what we're trying to pull out of this table, then we wanna bring it down and just look at this collection. And maybe we'll try and sample it and then realize that that doesn't ex work in Ruby 1.8.7. Uh, for the arrays, and then just have a bit of fun there. And that's hpercot. And it works. I've, I've shown my work. I didn't just do screenshots and say, this definitely happened. You got to see some typing, albeit pre-recorded, because no way is I going to type in real time. Um, but let's look at some of the library code. For all the slides that are in this manner, I show the link to the code and also the date for the commit where it was pulled. Um, this is got a few things going on. I'll, I'll do some highlighting. The first that I liked is that we have def hpercot as a method at the top. You know, so, so normally, oh wait, a capital at the, at the front of a, of a method? No, that's wrong. And then wait, but we have a module hpercot. How are we defining a method at the top? But that is what facilitates this really cool API where you're calling hpercot directly and then it's passing you down into the module and, and uh, um, running make with your input. And it's able to facilitate that API second Y'all probably are familiar with going self inside your modules or your classes. Self is hpercot. And that was a, another way that was quite common back then. I'm sure your linter would scream at you if you did it now. But the thing that I like about this approach is that's what you call in real life. That's what you see hpercot.make, right? It's not self, but I know what I, what I mean when I'm calling self. Let's look at some more code. This is the blank slate class. Somebody can come up to me later and correct me if I'm wrong, but I know it was referenced in a Jim Wyrick talk around this, uh, maybe a year or two before this time. I believe it was invented for Rake, and it was used here as well. And the beauty of the uh, blank slate class is it gives you an abstract base class with no predefined methods, except you see the exception here, underscore, underscore to cover, underscore, underscore, send and ID, and also instance eval. But that means if you're doing like a dynamic proxy that you wanna depend on method missing and have no collisions, this is the class that lets you do all of that. And now going into config, we do a couple of things, some that I've talked about and some that are new. So I'll highlight again. So we're, we're still, instead of doing self, we're, we're, we're saying config. And then the second is called recursively. And then the second is colon, colon. Colon, colon to call a method. There are 13 ways to call a method in Ruby. There's a popular article that there's 12 ways to call a method in Ruby. And this was not in those lists. You can definitely call colon, colon. I never did until I realized this in this talk. But I thought maybe I was wrong. So I tweeted about it a week ago to Gregory Wittek with uh, Booking.com. And I said, I believe, like I was a little nervous. I was like, I think this is another way? Like, or have I misinterpreted Ruby and I'm just being stupid? And you know what, he replied, 12 years of using Ruby, no idea that that was possible, that you could just call colon colon instead of full stop. <laughs> Why does this matter? I believe that we can use that, and I think it has been used historically, to communicate a little bit more information. When you have something that can be done two ways that's identical in Ruby, as engineers we can develop our own idioms that say, hey, when I do it with this thing, I'm also telling you something else. Maybe there's a third party API wrapper. And also uh, talking about self a bit, like here's a snip, snippet from Ruby talk in 2006, all the different ways to approach self uh, in class methods. Um, it's a, it's a long-running discussion. And then one more here, we have uh, alias method, whereas I think we're very used to alias, but it's, this is just another thing that I saw that was quite unique. This leads me into my second gem that I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Uh, I'm not gonna ask if you've heard of it. It's no Kogiri. I'm a little nervous to be talking about this. I didn't really think ahead. Are Mike D'Alessio or Aaron Patterson in the room? Good, oh, hey, hey, Mike. So Mike, Mike, so <laughs> Mike, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, 
Yes, uh, so Mike uh, is the, <laughs> oh God. He is, for, for, I believe for, for 10 years, been the core maintainer, but I also believe you may have been working on Nokogiri for longer than that. Um, and Nokogiri is the industry standard HTML parser gem. And, and, and thank you to Mike and for the work that you do, because so much of our infrastructure sets on that gem. It's like the, it's like the relevant X, XKCD, you might have seen it, about like the one project that like everybody relies on, and it's you know, not hundreds of people. So like, very much appreciate it. Uh, Noko Geary was developed uh, by Aaron Patterson in 2008 as a drop-in replacement for HPercot with a similar DSL. Um, it was marketed as being faster and less buggy, and I believe in both cases it were true. There's a little bit more history there if you want to do a deep dive, but it's not germane to this talk. And um, we'll just do a tiny bit of um, Noko Geary here, just again to prove that I did it. It's a beautiful library in that it's like Ruby-esque with the principle of least surprise. Um, require Ruby gems. Before Ruby 1.9, you had to require Ruby gems. Some might remember that. Uh, in the 2008 version, it had a direct drop in replacement for HPercot. So you could literally, literally and this is me saying hello, um, and this would work directly in your library. But it also adopted the uh, forward parenthesis. And I think a lot of this DSL is the same today. Mike can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, and, and this is just showing me doing a lot of the different parsing. So either calling CSS or you know search. It's one of those ones that you could actually not have to look through the docs and you'd understand how it works uh, just straight out of the box. So let's look at some of the uh, library code circa 2008 for uh, Nokogiri. And again, so this, this is important. So what I just ran there isn't, in, isn't today's Nokogiri. It was uh, set back to a commit from 2008 and installed that, the version from there. And this is 2008 uh, Nokogiri as well. So again, this, um, May have, not, may have changed quite a bit. Um, if you've been coding Ruby for more than maybe seven years, nothing here looks interesting, right? And it's not like, oh, that's, that's, that's Ruby code. If you've been coding less than seven years, you might say, what? Hey, I can't do, I can't do multi-line for a curly brace. What's going on with that? And there was a great discussion about this from Avdi Grimm just over a decade ago, and I'm gonna read this exactly about this um, approach. He said, use curly brackets for functional blocks where the primary purpose of the block is to return a value. Use do end for procedural blocks where the primary purpose of the block is its side effects. That is, the block is intended to change the state of the system. Later on in this blog, Avdi reflected that he'd seen this before. This wasn't something that he made up, and he dug through the archives, and, and, and I did too, and I think I agree that this is the first reference to it, seven years earlier, so 17 and a half years ago, from again, Jim Wyrick saying the big remaining question in Ruby coding style is when do you use either or? And he said he used the curlies that return values and he used do end for blocks that execute for their side effects. And this is something I hinted to earlier, this has the advantage of using your choice of block delimiter to convey a little bit extra information to the engineer reading the code. And because of this, Avdi Grimm referred to this as the Wyrick convention and I am sticking with it too. I think a few others are as well. Let's do some more code. Oh, well, this is fun. This is what I was talking about earlier, but seeing it in the wild, and I'll highlight again. This is a colon colon method call. And we're doing camel case instead of snake case, which makes me think that this isn't just some weird idea I've had, but back in 2008 there was some, uh, I actually didn't d deep dive into this method, I probably should have, um, but for certain types of methods, colon colon might have a different kind of feel as, as opposed to the full stop or, or dot for the method. And then I think it, this was even communicated further by swapping from snake case to camel case for the method. And then if we go into here, and I'll, I'll probably just highlight the use of and. Um, and's kind of gotten a hard time the last decade. So is or. And if I'm allowed to quote Avdi Grimm for a second time in this talk, Avdi poo-pooed and and or for a while, but then kind of came back about this, their ability to communicate more information or, or add more to Ruby. And he said, I think their reputation for being confusing stems from thinking of them as Boolean logic operators at all. If you think about them that way, then you have to keep remembering how they differ from ampersand, ampersand, and pipe, pipe. Whereas if you think of them as control flow operators in the same vein as you know if and unless, they're a lot more self-explanatory. So in, instead of, you know, next if one equals, or foo equals one, foo equals one and next. 
So there we go. I have, I have shown you two demos of real gems working in 2008, I've shown you how to get there. I've, I've kind of communicated the ethos of why in the world you'd want to do that. But you can only go so far with that. You only have so much fun. So for this next bit, I am going to run on this 2008 machine with all 2008 dependencies, a full stack web application. I'm gonna make it accessible to the whole world. And I'm not gonna use Rails, because I'm at RubyConf. Not, Rails is Ruby, but I feel like it'd be the easy low-hanging fruit to be like, oh, what version of Rails 2008? So today, I am going to build a camping app. Who is familiar with camping? Oh, that's pretty, this is my crowd. That's pretty good. Uh, camping was again, so I'm focusing on why because of what I said earlier. Uh, there's a micro framework that was very small. It's either 3.9 kilobytes, 39 kilobytes, something like that. And the idea was that you could write your whole web app in one Ruby file. Of course you could extract it out. It was pure Ruby. You could do whatever you want. But the idea is that you could do model view controller in one file. And it was actually a big part of the inspiration for Sinatra and even Flask. I learned this uh, a couple of weeks ago from a post from GitHub talking about why and the link from camping to Flask. So again, things that we enjoy today uh, that, that have these sort of origins. So what, what do I need to do with my Vagrant box to make this work? There's a few Vagrant settings that you enable. A lot of these come from uncommenting things in a config file, which uh, enable your private network so you can actually talk to it from the outside and send in HTML requests. And then also the easiest thing is getting a synced folder, and all that does is bring in a folder that you can write in your own machine. Uh, so VS Code, so you're not trying to vim in this box and like have a really hard time. Um, and have direct access to it there. Then I changed my setter host to give kind of a cool syntactic sugar for accessing the website. And I'm the cheat for like ngrocking in, just so people can access it. So with all this pulled down, um, I use the same flow as before my two-step approach to uh, bringing down a gem. I started to reach some of the limitation of it here because this had maybe six dependencies. And because I had to do this two-step, I literally had to do like old school Ruby manual dependency installation like myself. And it made me appreciate uh, Bundler even more and all the work that people do at Bundler. And once you have that done and you have a camping RB file written, you just do camping and then directory. So if, if you did this, any RB file that was camping compliant would run. And with this, I had a Webrick server going. But what's in there? What, what does this look like? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some code that I'd written for this particular application and, and kind of explore it. Uh, and it's kind of influenced by some of the examples as well from why. So you have camping goes blog. That's where you kind of define what this is going to look like. Everything's going to be namespaced, you know, module blog. And then you have your models. In 2008, actually, um, it had an active record dependency. Later maintainers did remove it, but I want to be on, uh, honest to the time that I was in there. So you have uh, your models here and uh, red cloth uh, mentioned in there, which is also some work with Y. And with your views, you write it in, uh, well, you can write in whatever you want because this is how it's designed, but the default would be Markaby. All right, one more time. Anyone familiar with Markaby? Boy, we're still getting there. So markup is Ruby, which allowed you, uh, again, why, which allow you to write markup as Ruby. Some of you might be like, gosh, that almost looks Hamill-esque if you got rid of the ends or something. You know, it's, it's, it's very intuitive, and it just kind of probably heavily depends on method missing and does what you expect it to do, and it could probably kind of extend with whatever tags you were trying to call. Your migrations would also be in this file. And something that I thought was interesting, I saw uh, uh, quite a bit in Wise work and uh, elsewhere is underscore underscore end being used. I don't actually really use that in day to day. And a few of you, because we have the best Rubyists in the world in the room, obviously, are very familiar and probably you're slinging this out every other day, having your latte and just writing it into your code. But uh, I'd heard of this for the first time on a tweet from Gemma Isroff uh, in the last month. And then I literally saw it in the code about two days later while I was preparing for this talk. And what, what N does is it tells Ruby that everything after me, just, just ignore it. Treat, it. treat it almost like a comment. So put it at the end of your file. Doesn't matter. But also, if you declare it, it's accessible via a global uh, constant called data, all caps data. So that means if you're keeping track at home, there's three Ns you can write in Ruby. Lowercase, lowercase end, which is ending the, the normal end. Uppercase end, which is a special thing that you can pass a block that will run at the end of the file. And there's the double underscore and 
which uh, does a comment. So what, what, what's the utility of this? How can this help in this one line file? Well, if you're why, it lets you write CSS. So throw your CSS on your RB file, and then you're able to write everything you want, and then when you go into your style class, you just read it in, you swap out where the end is, and there you go, your CSS is read in. I love it. That's how I want to do it from now on. Where's my CSS file? It's right here. I, I was running. It worked. Uh, 2008, full stack web application, writing some blog posts, saying hello to Twitter, and I'll get into that in a second, and I had it running. And as a part of an experiment for this talk, for 20 minutes, I opened an NGROC tunnel to this website. And I said, hey, anybody who's out there, feel free to come in and look at whatever I have on this NGROC, like a Bitcoin miner for you. And I got, I got a couple of hits, but I only got one like on this tweet. Shocking, isn't it? One like? Come on, this is a great tweet. It's from Andrew Mason, who has definitely gone to this URL. So thank you, Andrew Mason, who's here today. <laughs> Andrew is ready at all times for some sweet content, time sensitive to drop on my Twitter, and was ready and, and looked at a website from thousands of miles away that was built on Y technology. So thank you very much for that. So whew, Ruby archaeology is fun, right? It's really a treat. To, to start a project where you know you're not going to have a deliverable for a customer or, or try to change the game on performance or, or invent some new gem. You're just going into the past with valid Ruby code. And Ruby, like for running Ruby, there's a gem I didn't reference today, Bloopsophone from Y, that uh, came out, probably didn't have an update since 187 or 19, and I was going to go into it, but it runs on 3.0. So, you know, Ruby has, there's huge areas of how we write Ruby and what it means for an engineer to write Ruby that have not changed. So this code is actually super accessible even today. And, and, and it's been enjoyable and, and great to be able to give this talk with it. For uh, future considerations, I think I want to put my past Ruby's web archive, so not the newsletter, but the website on camping. And I think I want to put it on the camping that I've shared there because I don't need all the bells and whistles to uh, host a big site. I'm going to do a future talk dedicated to one gem that was so gnarly I couldn't fit it in today, and it has to be its own talk. You can ask me about that at the bar. And I'd love to update my box to have like a Schwad install instead of a gem install, so you're not having to remember those two commands every time you want to pull a gem down to the machine, right? So why should you become a Ruby archaeologist? There are hundreds of millions, if not billions, of lines of valid code, open source for free on the internet that you can access today. In the Ruby community today, sometimes it feels like we're converging. And when I look at Ruby code, again, with all the same tools we have now from 13 years ago, there's a lot of different ways to express yourself. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have standards at work and like have really predictable apps so engineers can come in and understand your code. I'm not saying do crazy metaprogramming and obfuscate, intentionally obfuscated code golf. No, I'm just saying we should be open to these ideas. And to help you, I have something to give you today. This is, uh, I released this Vagrant box myself. Schwad, Ruby Archaeologist. The current version is 0.3.0. Just run the command at the bottom of the screen, Vagrant in it, Schwad Ruby Archaeologist, Vagrant up, and you can have it. What's in the box? Ruby 1.8.7, an example camping app and all the dependencies and many, many more gems that I ran in there to play with this. So I say to you, go forth, explore the past Ruby, share them with me, and see what we can learn and make Ruby whimsical, fun, and better for everyone. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure of my lifetime to have the chance to speak at RubyConf and connect with me anywhere, and it's been an honor. Thank you so much.